Okay, so now that we've done that, we've gone over the normal physiology. Let's go over what happens in Parkinson's disease and how that affects this normal circuitry, all right? So first off, we're gonna talk about some of the hypothetical theoretical causes that they believe can cause Parkinson's disease after this, but let's assume that there's damage here to this dopaminergic neurons, right? So let's say if for some reason there's damage. So these neurons are damaged within the actual substantia nigra. Specifically, these neurons are actually coming from a specific point. It's actually called the pars compacta. And there is another one called the pars reticularis. But most of the neurons, there's damage within the pars compacta. That's where it's a lot of, there's compaction of a lot of these dopaminergic neurons, right? But if these neurons are damaged, what happens to the dopamine release here on these GABAergic neurons? It's going to decrease, right? So again, what was the overall effect of the dopamine on this one? This was the D1 receptor. This was the D2 receptor, right? Because the D2 goes through the indirect. The D1 goes through the direct. D1 loves to stimulate. D2 loves to inhibit. And that normally helped to be able to in enhance the movement within the direct pathway and try to increase or decrease the inhibitory movement in the indirect pathway so that we have very, very good movement, right? Now, if there's less dopamine, so let's look at the direct pathway first. If there's less dopamine released onto this neuron then, less dopamine, it's gonna have less stimulatory input. If it has less stimulatory input from dopamine, then this actual action potential, we can say that the action potentials of these GABAergic neurons will drop a little bit. So we're gonna say that the GABAergic neurons, their action potentials here that are coming from the Pudamin, all the way to the globus pilatus internus, is decreasing a little bit. And that should make sense because there's less stimulatory input from the dopamine because these neurons are destroyed. Then, if there's less GABA being released, so that if there's less action potentials, there'll be less GABA being released here. So then there'll be less GABA. And if there's less GABA being released here, then what happens? If there's less GABA, there's less inhibitory in, uh, inhibitory potentials, right? Inhibitory postsynaptic potentials on that neuron. If there's less inhibition, it releases it from inhibition and stimulates this guy. And this guy will have action potentials that'll be increasing and progressing towards the thalamus. And if there's an increase in action potentials, what will happen? It'll release what? A lot of GABA. And if it releases a lot of GABA onto these Neurons within the thalamus, GABA is inhibitory, it's going to inhibit this neuron. And there's going to be decrease action potentials that are going to be moving up to the cerebral cortex. And if you remember, I didn't show this in the other part, but we do have what's called the cortical spinal thalamic tract. And we'll talk about this when we get into the nervous system. But let's say that we do stimulate the primary motor cortex, right? It will come down through these neurons that extend all the way from the cortex, and it'll actually move and it'll decussate the pyramids of the medulla, it'll come down through the spinal cord and it'll actually synapse. If we do the lateral corticospinal thalamic tract, it'll synapse, it'll come down the lateral white column and synapse on the neurons within the ventral gray horn. And these cell bodies within the ventral gray horn will come out through an alpha motor neuron and innervate a muscle to cause contraction. But what have we done here? We've inhibited the amount of impulses that are going to the cerebral cortex. So what will happen to this impulses going out to the muscle? There'll be decreased impulses. That's not a good thing. Now, how does this affect the indirect pathway? Because we should see how it affects both pathways, not just one, right? Now, if dopamine is being released here normally, it's inhibiting this neuron. But now you're releasing less dopamine onto this neuron. If there's less dopamine being released here, then it's gonna have less inhibitory input. If it has less inhibitory input, technically you release it from inhibition or you stimulate it, right? So then what happens here? this should actually have slightly increased action potentials. So if there's more action potentials coming down this neuron, what's gonna happen? It's gonna release more GABA. And if there's an increase in GABA, there's gonna be more inhibitory input on this neuron. If there's more inhibitory input on this neuron, then what's gonna happen? It's gonna have less action potentials. If there's less action potentials, you're gonna release less gamma amino butric acid. If there's a decrease in the amount of gamma amino butric acid that you're releasing onto this guy, it's going to have less inhibitory impulses, or less inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, I should say, 
and then it's going to try to have less inhibitory effects on it and then release it from inhibition or slightly stimulate it, right? So now the action potentials coming up this way should actually be a little bit greater. So you should have more action potentials coming up. If you have more action potentials coming up, you're going to release a lot of glutamate. Glutamate is a stimulatory neurotransmitter. He loves to cause EPSPs, right? So he's going to stimulate this neuron. And if he stimulates this neuron, this neuron will then have a lot of action potentials. And if he has a lot of action potentials, he's going to release a lot of GABA. And if you release a lot of GABA or gamma amino acid gas, you can call it, it will do what? Inhibit these neurons within the thalamus. And so then look what happens to the impulses that are going back up to the cortex. It's decreasing. Holy frick, that's not a good thing. All right? So now, think about this. We have less stimulatory input coming to the cortex from the direct pathway, and we have less stimulatory input or even more inhibitory input coming from the indirect pathway to the cortex. So then what's going to happen to the input that is going down to the muscles? It's going to drop like a mofo, right? So if there's a significant drop, what's going to happen? These guys are going to have a hard time being able to contract their muscles, right? So that's, this is going to lead to what's called, so this effect right here, specifically due to this effect on the direct pathway and indirect pathway, that is going to be the primary cause of akinasia or bradykinasia, okay? So specifically, what we just went over, the effect on the direct pathway and the indirect pathway due to the loss of dopaminergic neurons causes akinasia or bradykinasia because they're going to have a hard time what? Their muscles aren't going to want to contract, so they're going to have a hard time being able to initiate the movement. They're going to have a hard time being able to stop the movement, and they're going to have a hard time being able to resist the movement. What do I mean by that? They have a really, really hard time getting started. So if, you, if they start walking, they have what's called a, a shuffling gait, right? So they have a shuffling gait. They have a really hard time being able to move. But then once they get moving, if you try to have them stop on a dime, they're not going to be able to. They're going to have a really, really hard time being able to stop the movement because that involves muscles. Then on top of that, if you push on them, if you push on them, what's going to happen? Retropulsion. They're going to fall back because they can't resist that motion to come back right, to normal position. So that's not a good thing. So again, what's happening due to the destruction or the abnormal effect on the direct pathway and indirect pathway? Akinasia or bradykinasia, which affects the gait, even their posture too. It can affect their posture. It can lead to the postural instability too. One other thing due to this effect, this direct pathway and indirect pathway. It's also going to affect the muscles of facial expression. So what would you expect there? That mask face, right? And if they have that mask face, what is that doing? It's causing this mask face or this expressionless face, okay? That's going to cause that now. All right, so we talked about that. That's good. We got to one thing. All right, we got to two things actually. Now let's talk about how we get the tremors and how we get the rigidity now. Okay, so remember I talked to you here about the cholinergic neurons, right? which are the ones that release acetylcholine. And remember I told you that if, if the dopamine that's being released here is stimulating that neuron, the cholinergic neurons love to be able to oppose dopamine. So what would they do? They would want to inhibit that neuron. And then if dopamine is trying to inhibit this neuron, cholinergic neurons here would want to be able to oppose that, so they would want to stimulate this neuron. They love to be able to oppose the dopamine. So now, Dopamine normally is being able to, so not normally, they actually use this chart a lot to be able to kind of better explain this. Let's imagine I have a seesaw here, and here's acetylcholine, and here's dopamine. Okay? So if I have acetylcholine, I have a dopamine right there, right? What happened to dopamine levels when you have Parkinson's disease? No, normally they're in a balance, and that balance is what be able to prevent you from having the tremors and the rigidity, right? But whenever dopaminergic neurons are decreasing because of their degeneration, this concentration of dopamine is going down. It's offsetting the balance. And then what's happening to the cholinergic neurons? They're going, their effect is increasing. So if you think about that, this increased effect due to that change, that, that abnormal balance because of the cholinergic and dopaminergic neurons, that fluctuation is what causes specifically the tremors, and the rigidity. So that is the cause of the tremors and the rigidity. So again, what causes the, the tremors and the rigidity? Tremors, they say it's even due to a lot of, there's what's called reverberating circuits, that are a lot of reverberating circuits present within this area to be able to maintain the normal action potentials throughout this area. 
And whenever these dopaminergic neurons are actually affected, it alters those reverberating circuits. And whenever the reverberating circuits are altered, it actually increases. And that's what causes those tremors. And rigidity is also affected by the decrease in dopamine and increase in cholinergic effect. So that's really, really important. So again, tremors, rigidity, affected by the imbalance within cholinergic neurons and dopaminergic neurons. Okay, now that we've done that, we've basically, in a nutshell, talked about a lot of the pathophysiology, a lot of the, the neural mechanisms that are associated with Parkinson's disease. Now let's go ahead and talk about some of what the hypothetical or the theoretical causes that they believe can actually cause Parkinson's disease. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about what are some of the hypothetical or theoretical causes that they believe can cause Parkinson's disease. Because whenever you're trying to be able to diagnose Parkinson's disease, there isn't really any special test to being able to diagnose it. Really, what most people, whenever they, they believe, they go to the doctor, the doctor you know, evaluates them, looks at their signs and symptoms, and then usually if they believe that they might have Parkinson's disease, they put them on L-DOPA, and then just look to see what the actual outcome of that is. We'll talk about that. So now, they believe that there is some type of genetic mutations that are causing this. One of them that they believe is actually one of the, they're really linking it to, is a specific mutation in LRRK2 gene, which stands for leucine rich repeat kinase type 2. Whenever this gene is mutated, it has three effects, all right? Normally, kinases love to phosphorylate certain types of proteins and enzymes and complexes. But sometimes that can be a good thing and a bad thing because phosphorylation might inhibit or it could stimulate. So then if this gene is, if this gene is affected, it can have three underlying effects. Now normally it controls the endosome and lysosome degradation pathway, right? But what happens is when there's a mutation in this gene, it disrupts the normal activity of the endosome lysosome pathway. And we'll talk about the, how that can actually affect Parkinson's. Another thing is it alters specific signaling mechanisms. So it can phosphorylate certain proteins that can alter or disrupt specifically one of these actual signal transducers, which is called ROS, and then another one which is called MAP kinase. So these are some nice signal transducers that can go to the specific genes and either turn genes on, right? So if this is normally disrupted, that can throw off another type of effect. What's that effect? So you know, whenever neurons are being able to, they're actually causing their vesicular transport. So normally, let's say here's our neuron, and let's say here, these black dots that I have right here are the vesicles, all right? ROS and MAP kinase work through specific mechanisms that controls the vesicular transport down to the axon bulb. And then it also controls the dopaminergic release. So what happens is whenever there is a defect within this enzyme, it alters this. And so the ROS MAP kinase pathway is affected and decreased. So then you have decreased vesicular transport and decreased dopaminergic output. That's one of the theories they believe to be due to. Another one, they also, there's a specific protein called tau, tau protein. And what they believe uh, this leucine rich repeat kinase enzyme, whenever it's mutated, it actually increases the phosphorylation of this protein. And whenever you phosphorylate the tau protein, it can increase in concentration and lead to what's called neurofibrillary tangles. And they believe that can actually cause an effect on this actual dopaminergic neuron, and it can lead to cell death of this neuron. How does this endosome lysosomal pathway affect it? Well, the endosome lysosomal pathway normally helps to be able to degrade a specific molecule called alpha synuclein, which is a lipid binding protein. But if this endosome lysosomal pathway is actually disrupted, so this activity is decreasing, alpha synuclein concentration goes up. And then when it aggregates and starts, alpha synuclein molecules start aggregating and clumping, it forms what's called Lewy bodies. And these Lewy bodies are believed to also have an effect on these dopaminergic neurons and increase the cell death. But they don't completely know the mechanism. But whenever they do, they look at a biopsy, they'll notice a lot of Lewy body accumulation within the substantia nigra. So that's what the, some, one of the theories. Okay, so they talked about that one. Another one is called PARC2. It's a specific gene that encodes for what's called a 
E3, ubiquitin, ligase. And all this molecule does is it puts a ubiquitin molecule on specific proteins or peptides that are designed to be broken down. So there's actually something right here. I'm going to draw it in like circles here. This molecule is called a proteasome. And this proteasome is designed to be able to break down peptides. So normally, let's say here's a peptide. This peptide will run through this proteasome, and the proteasome will chop the frick out of it and break it into fragments. But if this enzyme right here is defective, the normal peptide that's actually being broken down is alpha-synuclein. If alpha-synuclein isn't getting broken down, what happens to its concentration? It goes up. And if an alpha-synuclein concentration goes up, you get increased Lewy body formation. And that's another theory that they link to this. Another one. Another one is actually going to be called DJ1. And DJ1 is believed to, let's actually make some room over here, DJ1 is believed to affect normal proteins and enzymes that control, so proteins that control oxidative stress. So let's call these proteins, let's say that they're antioxidant proteins because they're controlling the oxidative stress. And there's also proteins that are affecting mitochondrial function. So now, if these proteins are affected or if they're decreased due to this mutation within that gene, then it can lead to increased reactive oxygen species and increased mitochondrial dysfunction. And if that's the case, they've linked that to also causing this death of these dopaminergic neurons. Okay, so we've talked about one, two, three, there is another one, and it's called PINK1, and PINK1 is also working in the same concept here, too. We actually can link that to the DJ1, and they've also linked the, uh, the, part, the PINK1 also with specifically the tau protein accumulation. So they've also linked PINK1. But there's a lot of overlap. You'll notice that there's a lot of overlap. That's why it's not completely defined of what's really the cause. Okay, so these are some of the specific genetic mutations they believed. Another type is insecticides. Okay, so other insecticides that they believe to be linked to it is, you know, any type of insecticide consisting of DDT or rotenone. And they believe that this can actually cause some type of problem where it can lead to neuron death. One more, and this is actually called MPT. And MPTP stands for 1-methyl-4-phenyl, uh, 1,2,3,6-tetrahydropyridine, uh, uh, but that doesn't matter. All right, but there was a drug uh, in that this in gentleman was trying to be able to synthesize to make a synthetic opioid. It was called MPPP. But what happened is when he was trying to make this synthetic opioid drug, there was a contamination of the MPPP with MPTP. Now, MPPPP is designed to be able to act as a synthetic opioid, but MPTP is a neurotoxin. And whenever there was the impurities that accumulated within this MPPP, it can actually cause destruction of the dopaminergic neurons. And whenever there's destruction of the dopaminergic neurons, what's the overall result of all of this? Less dopamine release. And that's some of the theories that they believe. Now, MPTP was actually proven to cause it, but it was due to this gentleman who actually was synthesizing this drug. He literally had impurities and injected it into himself and ended up with an acute onset of Parkinson's disease at a young age.